My name is Dennis Nelson. I'm one of the retired pastors uh, that belongs to this congregation. And this Lenten season, I've been asked to do the leading of the worship services. And uh, I want to welcome you to the service. I'll say something about my face in just a moment. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to remind you that this is, good, uh, this is the Desert Hills Lutheran Church. And that we have a mission. And that mission is to celebrate, Grace. to make, Grace. and to make as we live our lives. I love that we have that mission. It's a good one. And I'm thrilled that this congregation keeps it in mind so many ways as it goes about its life. All right. Now, uh, I have a face that my wife said needed makeup tonight, but I decided to eschew the makeup. I'm just here as I am. Uh, I was walking the other evening uh, on the way back to a car after we'd been on a little visit to a concert. And I stepped toward the car with this foot, and I was sure I stepped with this foot, but I didn't. And uh, I landed on my face on the cement about, about that far from a stucco wall, which I could kind of look kind of like a cheese grater coming at me as I was thinking down. I think it wasn't good. So I did some, uh, developed some internal leakage on the skin. Nothing bad's happened, but I look a little weird, but... You know, this is, I, like Popeye says, I am what I am. <laughs> That's how it is for tonight. Okay. Um, I want to thank those who are uh, here helping me tonight. Gordon, I've already mentioned. And Ruth uh, K. is the way I say her last name, because there are other letters I spirit that I can't make sound right. So we just go with Ruth K. Thank you, Ruth, for being here and for helping. Uh, Hold an evening prayer is the uh, service that we use during this Latin season. I'm Sure, many of you have been here before for that, and I really enjoy it. I think you do as well. And I've missed having it these last uh, seasons when we had COVID keeping us apart and not able to sing. Um, everything you need is in your little booklet, uh, and we'll uh, use it in just a moment. Uh, we'll take a little break in the order when we get to the lesson of the day. I'll read it. There'll be the message then, and then we'll continue the rest of the whole evening prayer service. Uh, as I said, everything you need is in the book. And the importance of that is that you remember that the books need to be here next week for the people that are here to worship. So if you'd be so kind when the service is concluded to pass them all toward the center of the church, wherever you're seated, it'll make it easier for the people that pick them up to do that. So thank you for that. A couple of other announcements. Um, one is that uh, the midweek offering uh, for Lent offerings go to Lutheran Campus Ministries of Arizona, half of the income from that, 25% to ELCA World Hunger, which will be helping, I'm sure, with the uh, tragedies that are happening in Eastern Europe just now, and 25% uh, go to ELCA Global Mission, which uh, does good things, helps people, and spreads the gospel in lots of places in the world. So when we get to the offering time, I trust you'll uh, be ready for that. Let's uh, begin with uh, Hold an Evening Prayer on the first page of your little booklet, and we should be ready to go. Okay. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. Every land and race Now as it 
This side is going to be number two. This side is going to be number one. Ruth's going to help you folks. I'm going to sit with the people over here. Okay. All right. First, we start out all together. Go, Gordon. prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround us and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. There is a reading from the scripture tonight. It's from John's 15th chapter, uh, verses 12 through 16. Jesus is speaking. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. So the, the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So far the reading from Holy Scripture. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. People so dearly loved of God, grace and mercy and peace are yours in Jesus. Tonight, Jesus, our friend. 
During these Lenten weeks, my hope is to think with all of you about who Jesus is to us, that is to you and me, here and now. It fits because Jesus is at the heart of our faith. Like tonight, when one of the first songs, we, the first song we sung was, what a friend we have in Jesus. Or when times come that the song called for often at funerals, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. You know, he walks with me, he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. That's pictures, images that we're used to using about thinking of Jesus as our friend. But I think you need to know that I developed an effort that we're talking about Jesus in many different ways because I bought a book by, by a Professor Diana Butler Boss. It's called Bass, excuse me. It's called Freeing Jesus. And she points out that those who first knew Jesus knew him without any of the stuff that we bring along because of the history of the church. All of the theology, all of the doctrines, all of the things that we have used to speak of who Jesus is, those folks didn't have those things available to them. They just knew Jesus as a human being who was a friend in whom they saw God more closely than they ever had before. His life intersected with theirs in ways that made life different, better for them, and I believe ultimately for the world in so many ways. So, Professor Butler Bass wonders if we might do well to step back from 2,000 years of, of the accumulation of religious jargon and have during these days of this, Lenten, this series of Lenten Wednesdays an occasion to have an honest conversation about Jesus. Could we attempt, if we worked at it just a little bit, to put ourselves back into the shoes, into the lives of those who lived long ago, not because we want to be them or talk about long ago, but because living now as Christians, knowing who Jesus is makes an enormous difference. So I hope you can experience with me Jesus in a fresh way, to know, our, to know for ourselves what Jesus' first followers knew him to be. Over the weeks, we'll talk about Jesus as friend tonight, as teacher next week, then as savior, and then as Lord, and then as way. And then the five weeks will be done, and it will be Holy Week, and we'll be getting ready to celebrate Easter. But these are things that I think we can do to benefit our faith and our growth. I understand that to speak of a man whose life happened 2,000 years ago as a friend is a bit of a stretch to the ordinary way of speaking. But those who first knew Jesus did experience the nearness to God in Jesus that was beneficial to them in so many ways. And when he called them friend, as he did in the gospel lesson we read tonight, it must have been a powerful idea. This idea is not a strange one in the scripture, that somehow human beings are friends with something beyond themselves, with God. In an ancient story, told to describe the connection between humans and the power that fashioned human life, the creator, the first humans are pictured of walking with God in a garden, the Garden of Eden, I guess, in the cool of the day. I always liked that description. It sounded so, so homey, like the day was over, it was all warm, and now the sun had gone down, we know about that in the desert, and now it was cool in the evening, and it felt wonderful. And these friends, Adam and Eve, walking in this story that's told in Genesis, in the cool of the day with God. Or the book of Exodus tells us that God encountered Moses on Mount Sinai. And the visit was face to face as friends, the book of Exodus tells us. So when Jesus said, you are my friends, those first followers saw the God connection because they knew those stories very well. And they saw him even haltingly at first. But understanding that somehow there was a friendship with God that was forged and the connection that they had with him. Now, you know about friendship, that it's not dependent at all on proximity or even identical time frames. You have, like I do, Sue and I have, friends that we rarely see. But when we get together, you start talking, it's like you've never been apart. You know that kind of friend? Most of us, if we're fortunate, have friends like that. I think that's a quite a gift. Or think about like this. There are millions of people around the world who struggle with addiction and to a person, they would describe themselves as a friend of Bill W. Because people that are in the addictive community know the power of the 
program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and its founder, Bill W., is someone they can't see face to face, someone they can't touch, but nonetheless as a powerful friend in their lives because of the gift that he gives them. Those who first sensed that in Jesus the presence of God touched ordinary human existence met Jesus, as I've been saying, in a human, as a human friend. And that's important. Because sometimes when we talk about faith, we tend to use all of this language that describes somehow so many things that are next to impossible to describe in confident language that faith has developed over the years. And we forget that really those who first met Jesus realized, as Paul wrote later on, God was in him reconciling the world to himself. They were simply his friends, knowing that God was doing something special in him. So let's think about friendship for a little bit, the real experience of it in your life or mine. When I was about to begin my educational journey, that is when I was about to go into kindergarten, my mom and the moms of all kinds of other kindergartners to be walked to Lindale Elementary School in our neighborhood in Minneapolis. And all of us who were five-year-olds sat on the floor in front of a teacher who was standing in, in the middle of the room. And the parents uh, sat beside us, uh, behind us, was I think almost uniformly mothers in those days. Uh, And the teacher, whose name was uh, Mrs. McCaffrey, uh, told us all about what we needed to know, what we needed to bring to school on the first day. We needed to have a resting rug, for example, and other things that we had to have, and how the day would go, and what we hoped to accomplish during the year, and that she was willing to talk to them, and all those sort of things. So I went home from that preschool roundup day, absolutely certain that I knew what to do, that I would just be comfortable the first day of kindergarten. I was a kind of a, I don't know, confident kid anyway, I guess, when I was little, oldest in the family, and everybody thought I was wonderful. So, you know, when I, (laughs) when I went to school, I thought, yeah, this is going to be great. So the first day came, I walked the half block to the school. I went to the door that we'd gone to the roundup room, and I sat in that roundup room, and Mrs. McCaffrey, the one I'd seen before, introduced herself, and then she called the roll. And when she got to the end, she said, is there anyone in the room whose name I didn't call? Uh, I was that person. Wasn't feeling so confident just then. Uh, And she said, well, that's not a serious problem, but the first thing I learned in kindergarten was that I was in the wrong room. (laughs) I wasn't supposed to be in Mrs. McCaffrey's room. I was supposed to be in Mrs. McLeod's room. And Mrs. McLeod's room was in the basement of that school. It had window wells and all, but it was in the basement, truth be told. And she said, that's not a problem, Mrs. McCaffrey said. You just go out and down the steps, and there is the door, and that will be Mrs. McLeod's room. Just knock on the door, and she'll come and let you in. Well, I remember going down the steps, and I wasn't feeling confident at all. And I got to the door, and she was busy talking to kids, and I didn't want to interrupt, so I stood there for quite a while just wondering what to do. Finally, I sort of timidly knocked, and apparently she heard me. She came and welcomed me into the class. But then a wonderful thing happened. Mrs. McLeod said, Bobby Ryder, I need you to show Jenneth where to put his resting rug, and then have him come and sit down with you. The gift was that I got a friend. That was the wonderful thing. So, in that lonely and strange place, I had a connection. Bobby, my first kindergarten friend. Well, the next year, we were really good friends, Bobby Ryder and I. We gave Mrs. Segerstrom frequent reason to remind us not to talk when we were supposed to not be talking. To be listening when we weren't listening. To be reading when we were supposed to be reading and not fooling around with something that seemed entertaining to us. We enjoyed being together. That's what it is to be a friend, to have the enjoyment of simply being together. When it came down time to start second grade, that was in Minnesota, it always started the day after Labor Day. So I went to school on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. But that Thursday evening, I developed a high fever and a terrible headache and a stiff neck. And I had trouble swallowing. And my folks called the family doctor, A.B. Johnson, to come to the house. Doctors did that in those days. He came late at night. It was 
way past bedtime, and he looked me over and he made a quiet, tentative diagnosis that he shared with my parents out in the hall, but he didn't say anything to me. But the next morning, my dad took me in the car, uh, a Friday morning when he should have been going to work, but instead of going to work, he took me to the Sister Kenny Institute in Minneapolis. And there, a doctor whose name I happen to remember was Dr. Soljeskog, did a tap of my spinal fluid. And he looked in the microscope and confirmed the diagnosis. I had polio. I was hospitalized for eight weeks. And when I was out of the hospital, I was given careful instructions about exercises I was to do in the morning and in the evening. I was stretching and bending and strengthening and the kind of things that you, Sister Kenny really kind of invented what we know as physical therapy uh, out of that polio epidemic. Um, but I was also told to be very careful about overworking any muscles. They were very concerned about that, the people were that told me when I went home. I wasn't supposed to do any running or bike riding or anything like that. So when at last in March I returned to Lindale Elementary School, I remember the first recess time. Went outside. I was standing by a, about an eight-foot tall chain-link fence along Lindale Avenue and by myself. The other kids were running and playing, and I knew I couldn't do that. And across the way, over by the gymnasium wall, by the bike rack, Bobby Ryder was standing with two other kids that were in my class, Alan and Dennis Dean. And I signaled, waved my arms over my head. And happiness ensued when Bobby, Bobby uh, galloped like people did back in these days, because some of them who had TVs watched cowboy shows on TV. We happened not to have a TV, so we didn't watch cowboy shows, but I knew about them anyway. Bobby Ryder galloped over to me, and he said, I saw you signaling, and I thought I'd come over and see what's up. That was it. I don't remember what came next, but I can remember the warm, satisfying feeling of being seen and accepted and welcomed and part of his life. So when I say, I believe Jesus is my friend, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about some mystical something or other. I'm talking about the reality of being seen and understand, understood and valued in a way that includes me. A friend, Sally McFaig wrote, is someone who's fun to play with, someone you can trust. And I'm happy to tell you that now I'm in my 80th year and I have friends. I have more friends than I've ever had in my life. And it's a wonderful thing. Some of them let me play golf with them. I play just for fun and they kindly keep their observations about my great ineptitude to themselves. That's a kind thing. That's what friendship is like. It's the same in advancing years as it is for kids. Being known, accepted, seen, valued, that's a friend's benefit. So I have to wonder if when Jesus said, unless you become like little children, you cannot become part of the kingdom of God. Let me restate it a little more simply. Truly I say to you, unless you return to that experience of first friendship like kids have, unless that way of trusting love and playfulness and knowing that you matter. If that isn't happening in your heart, you don't really have much understanding about the life that God promises. When I was little, I learned to sing like, I suppose many of you, Jesus loves me. It's a song about a Bible promise, and that part was emphasized a lot. But I think it's also a song about friendship. Because friendship is being welcomed, understood, accepted, valued by those we share life with. And those who first followed Jesus came to believe the truth of that Sunday school song. And they saw it the more as he lived his life among broken and hurting people. There was no limit to what Jesus would do to stand by his friendship with them. In fact, that's one way of telling the story of the cross. Nothing that he wouldn't do to stand by the love, the friendship that he had with those who loved him, in fact, with the whole human family, even when it was as costly as the cross. Christian faith is centered in, in Jesus, in knowing him, in trusting him, believing that he is, first of all, 
just simply our friend and what a gift it is. So the proclamation of the gospel tonight is just this, that in knowing Jesus, however that's true, whether it comes to you from the words of sacred scripture, whether it comes from the stories that you've encountered of Jesus in the world, whether it comes from all of those places in your life that remind you of what the gift of friendship is, that Jesus is your friend. And because you are Jesus' friend, you are, he said, a friend of God. Truly knowing that Jesus is our friend persuades us to live our lives making God's love real and accessible, tangible, practical in the lives of those who share our days. Jesus is our friend. Amen. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You, you shall, shall bear, bear a child, child and his, his name, name shall be Jesus, Jesus the, the chosen one of Israel's time. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live to do your will. Everybody now. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and your spirit rejoices. when I'm singing the hum, the uh, refrain, each time that I'm singing the petition, and then at the end of it, you sing the response. So let's try it together. He will play it once, we'll hum it together, and sing through that one verse, and then we'll go on with the petitions. I think you'll figure it out. Let's hum. Oh, 
justice might guide them. For all those who labor in service to others, grant weather that nourishes all of creation. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy, help us, comfort us all of our days. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Let us bless our God. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives. May the Spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. Amen. Go and see.